Um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Roger. I'm the president of Isaac A New, and um, what this is this workshop is called uh, part of a series of workshops called Go Lead Workshops, which is focusing on kind of like leadership management, strategy, all that kind of stuff. You, some of you may have noticed that um, there were two previous workshops done before um, last semester. This was um, this is my own kind of personal project trying to work out this, and now I've kind of turned this into a, an actual Isaac kind of thing. Um, so today, obviously, what you saw on the description page is about um, strategic planning, in a way. But um, it's not just some broad kind of strategic planning, but more of a kind of a specific type of strategic planning. And um, so if you had watched the first workshop, um, you may have noticed that there were um, some models that, um, obviously, you probably haven't seen before. And uh, although I designed this to be modularized, so you don't necessarily have to understand the previous ones, although they kind of help. So um, obviously a plug for my previous ones is to go on the isaacanu.org website and you can check out the previous ones or go on the isaacanu YouTube channel. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, today is um, I'm going to talk to you about efficiency, redundancy, vulnerability, and trust when it comes to any kind of system and any kind of plan. Um, and so, for example, for any system, efficiency is inversely proportional to redundancy. This will correspond to inverse proportionality between vulnerability and trust. So this is just a relationship right here. This is a big relationship, and I'll get into the nuts and bolts of how this actually works. But I'll come back to this in a, in a moment. Just kind of think that all of this stuff kinda is kind of related to each other. And yes. Okay, so basically, first, um, in any kind of plan or any kind of system, um, there's factors called, uh, there's a factor called efficiency and there's a factor called redundancy. And I'm sure you've heard these terms before, and obviously a lot of people are, uh, efficiency is good. You want to be efficient, you want to do things quickly, you want to do well with the least amount of resources. And I'm here tonight, uh, tonight to try to tell you that that is kind of a flawed concept, and actually, you shouldn't be too efficient. And the reason for that it's because, well, reason, I'll get to that. I'll first define exactly what efficiency is. Efficiency is defined as a ratio of output to input in any system. And so efficiency increases when the loss that comes from the system processing is minimized. So this comes from um, energy thermodynamics. Essentially, energy goes into some sort of process and energy comes out, as a, and there's a loss of energy in between. Um, for any kind of plan or strategic planning, you're essentially planning a system. Uh, a bunch of logical sector, um, logical modules or sections that process some sort of thing until you get some sort of um, output that you want, essentially. Um, so that's efficiency. And redundancy is defined as something that increases the reliability of a system in case of failures. So redundancy increases when statistically independent components are added in parallel to a system. So as you can see, this is a, this is a kind of a system um, and you have subsystem A all the way down to D. So there's obviously some sort of assumed inputs in any kind of system, and you have an assumed output. Again, in any plan, you're assuming certain f inputs inside your plan. And finally, you want to have some sort of preserved output. And so redundancy is when there are multiple systems. Now, one example would be, so for example, like uh, a computer. Um, I have a server under my bed, which has two, um, uh, what's this called, fans. So these two fans correspond to actually like um, things that provide the power. You know when you look into the computer, you plug into the power generator? That's also right where the fan is. The reason is because that place is most hot. Now, that server that I have is actually um, a commercial industrial server. So it's essentially, um, they, they require high redundancy because they need to have high availability. If that server, if that, I suppose, that fan breaks, then your system overheats, and then your computer shuts down, and then your computer has no business. I mean, your business has no business. That's why they have two fans in order to increase redundancy. So you can see, think of it as a fan. Each fan is a subsystem. So if they had three fans, more redundant. Four fans, even more redundant. Hmm. So here's a theoretical example to put them together, to link them into a kind of system. Um, now consider if a system has four necessary statistically dependent logical and valid components. So there's a, obviously a bell curve of inputs which leads to each subsystem, which obviously has a certain waste and is a bit of output. This is just a slightly more complicated example of the first one where we just showed energy going into a process, energy coming out, and there's a bit of waste coming out. Um, now, when you're obviously, when you're strategically planning any kind of thing, um, as I said, you're planning for inputs, you're planning for outputs, and you cross for each specific point. Like, um, 
Like for example, I need to do this, then I need to do that, then I need to do this. I can't start at D unless I have C, and I can't have C until I do B, and I can't have B until I do A. So inputs have to be processed by A, B, C, D input components in order to get desirable outputs. Each component uses, or in brackets, wastes energy. If any one of A, B, or C, or D fails, the system fails to produce a desirable output. So again, in any plan, if you only have four of these components where all of them are needed in logical uh, order, if, say, B doesn't work, such as you planned, um, I don't know, you, I plan to go and open that door, that obviously step A would be to move my leg, and then step B is to get down the step. Let's say step B, I trip, and I hit foot my face into the floor, then obviously I failed to get the desirable output, which is to open the door. Of course, I can get up and do it, but that's a redundant sector. That's, a, that's, an, that's another subsystem of B, if that was the uh, way you do it. And so the idea is basically, this is a really highly efficient system. As you can see, there are only four components to the system. Um, so my question to you guys is, this, why is the system flawed? Um, this is 100% efficiency. If you, can, if you think of each subsystem D as the most necessary um, logical and statistically dependent um, steps in your plan or any kind of system, why is that, um, why is that 100% efficient and why is that not necessarily desirable? And of course the lead on question is why do we want redundancy? So is that like if you have four things that run at 100% um, capacity, which increases the likelihood, because there are four engines that run at 100% capacity. Yeah. Um, so running at 100% capacity increases the likelihood <coughs> one of them breaking. Oh. Whereas if you had four run, five, if you had five mm. engines, plus a bit more expensive, but they're all running at, say, 75 or 80% capacity, less likely to break when one of them does break, then you can increase the capacity of the other. Okay. So yeah. That's um, sort of what you mean? Yeah. Um, Somewhat, um, again, uh, I guess I didn't fully explain this well. Okay, so when you say uh, certain engines, let's consider the whole system as, it all, as a whole. Let's think of it as a car. Yeah. So this, this car, right, has what? One engine, right? And if that engine breaks, oh, the car's not going to move. Simple as that. But if it has two, three, four engines, right, then, then obviously if that breaks, you still have three engines that could work. So in fact, you have three, four redundancy, redundant uh, factors. If your, if your input was essentially, um, let's say input was um, drive, like click the button to, to drive or hit the engine thing, and your, and your process was essentially like this, and each was an engine. Yeah. Engine, 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 engine. And then finally, the, the output, your, your perceived or your desired output is obvious to move your car, right? That, that's, a, that's a system which has a really high redundancy. So you have um, your input, your drive, and your output is move. This, this could be a plan. You plan to, to move your car, and once you click the button to drive. If that dies, then you still have three. Uh, that's what I kind of mean. Now, because there are four subsystems, I mean that essentially imagine uh, this, is, this is highly redundant. How do, you make this, how do we make this more efficient? We just take out that, we take out that, and we take out that. The greater, the more subsystems there are in any kind of module, such as get the engine, the, the greater the waste of energy. If you have four engines, that's going to use more energy than one engine. So in order to make the system more efficient, you cut it down to one engine. Yeah. So that's what it means. Now, right now, I've cut it down to one single thing. So it's completely 100% efficient. And, and that question was basically, why is this not necessarily desirable? Well, yeah, like if you, just because something is 100% efficient, I think it would lead to, lead to the answer, yeah. doesn't mean it's gonna work. That's what I'm saying. And, um, and if, if it breaks, then you're having low redundancy. Yeah. So I guess the answer to this would be that the reason this is not desirable is because there's no redundancy, and hence it's a high risk system. That if any one of those modules broke, then you, then you, then you failed, essentially. Um, <laughs> does everybody get those uh, kind of questions? Okay. So this is pretty simple kind of stuff. We'll move on to a bit more complicated stuff. Oh yeah, because of the system's propensity to fail. That's, that's the answer why, why we want to have a bit of redundancy. As you can see, this, this thing was exactly the same as the picture you saw just then, but there's an extra subsystem and hence a greater waste. And before we, before we get to move on to exactly what that is, is that let's figure out some assumptions first. The first assumption is the world is uncertain. 
if it was certain, then you don't need redundancy. Why bother having four different engines if you know that engine is gonna succeed every, one, every time you use it? So the world is uncertain. Does everybody agree the world is uncertain? <laughs> the inputs in any system are not set in stone. Because the world is uncertain, then uh, your inputs into the system, such as right now our planned input, our assumed input is obviously click the button, I mean like turn the key, but there could be other inputs such as, um, I don't know, the oil ran out, so therefore there was no oil inside the car, so therefore it's like scratching against the metal, or that you have no fuel. Um, obviously, this, as, you, as you can see, this is an assumed input. It's missing a lot of other inputs that are actually required in order to turn the engine on. And so the inputs in any system is not set in stone. Inputs, is, this is another assumption, inputs follow, follow, follow a bell curve. The inputs at the top of the bell curve is the ones that you think that is most likely. The inputs on the side of the bell curve is the ones that is least likely that you think. Now, the inputs, obviously, the inputs you plan for, and the outlier inputs fall into least likely. The less redundant your systems is, the more predictable the inputs need to be. This is a really important point. If your system is really low redundant, like the first picture you saw, where there's only four modules, then the inputs that you're, that's going into the system, which is a plan, has to be very predictable. So you must, you must know exactly what the inputs are. You must be sure what the inputs will be. Else you run the risk of meeting unexpected inputs, which will fail to be processed by one of your necessary components, which will cause, again, a cascading failure in your statistically dependent components. Any questions for that? Hmm? Can someone give me an example of when an unexpected input resulted in one of your components in your plan or system failing and therefore causing a cascading failure and uh, with the end result of not achieving the output that you wanted? <coughs> Anybody? Yeah, Chuck? Sure. Okay, oh, yeah, that's definitely, did, did you expect that you were not gonna get paid? Um, yeah, so you didn't expect that you were gonna get paid. So your whole, your whole plan in life was to, uh, you assumed that you were gonna get paid, but suddenly you didn't get paid, and then all these other things didn't work out, and hence you had to adapt. So that's one example of, of, a, of an input not working out. Adding a component in parallel will increase the energy required by the system, thus decreasing efficiency. So, why, so the, the whole idea is basically, if you increase redundancy, your efficiency will decrease. If you increase your efficiency, your redundancy will decrease. The reason being is that, like I showed before, is that the amount of energy, if you put more engines into one single module, th there's a greater amount of energy use. Yeah, hence, you have actually less efficiency. So the idea is basically, you want redundancies because they deal with outliers. Um, they deal with the variability of all, all sorts of inputs you're in your life. Um, the greater the variability of your inputs, the greater the need of any redundancy in any system. And so you could say that uh, because we're very uncertain about what, where we're heading towards, we often have conditionals. We say, if this happens, we'll do this. If this happens, we'll do that. That's essentially a redundancy measure. Uh, the, more, the more you plan for those kind of things, the more redundant your system becomes. The less you plan for that, the less redundant it becomes. The more efficient you become, but then again, the more risky your system and your plan becomes. So just reiterating, when you strip a system to its bare necessities, then it's operating at the greatest efficiency while well it's the lowest redundancy. Um, when, you all, when all you have is necessary components, then if one component fails, the whole system fails. There needs to be a balance between efficiency and redundancy so that a system can be as efficient as possible while maintaining redundancy to deal with the variability of inputs. So the question is like, how do we do this? Right, how do you balance between efficiency and redundancy? Does anybody know? Does anybody have a, have a system for where they try to um, balance how efficient you will become and where is and how redundant you become? I think most people do this actually naturally, but has it, does anybody have an actual mental model of doing this? Sure. But in our, since this workshop is called strategic planning, when you obviously strategize something like this, where you go, for example, starting raising Hope Foundation education, 
or getting your degree and all these kind of things. You do actually think about a plan for this, right? Right? So it's like, for, for example, a capitalism is just got a grant from the government to get into the prison. And one of the factors involved in the insulin was one on one. And the high school students were benefited in the prison and every week. Um, and every mentor that signs up says, yes, I will go every week. Mm. But the likelihood that one of them will get sick is high. Definitely. How yeah. mentoring, hmm. like it's like building a capacity for us to continue doing that. Yeah. So, like yeah. continuing to run the engine or whatever, hmm. we continue to be the mentor. So we have to build that into the program. Exactly, precisely. Um, that's a redundancy measure to deal with a variability of inputs, where it could be whether it is sick or not sick. Um, and so, so you, you've obviously planned for that specific input, but there's also obviously inputs you didn't plan for, because what happens, what if one two of your mentors die? Yeah. You know, about, about what about that input? Yeah. Uh, what if there's a terrorist yeah. going to the school and started blowing everybody up? Did you plan for that? You didn't. Exactly. You know why? Because that, that specific input, the probability of that happening is so low on your bell curve, it's kept at some really low point, and therefore you're not going to plan for that, which I'll actually get to the moment. So how do we, that, that actually does kind of answer the question of how do we do this? We have to consider vulnerability and trust. So as you can see, the first relationship was that there's efficiency and redundancy, and then there's vulnerability and trust. And so in order to do this, we have to first consider these two concepts. The so vulnerability is susceptible to failure in any system. Uh, vulnerability is determined by the probability of a failure scenario, such as the probability of, uh, like, that mentor being sick. The impact of the failure scenario. So if what if he's sick? Does he come in? Does he, you know, spread disease to everybody and suddenly there's a huge outbreak? Number of failure scenarios. Okay, well, you could get sick, you could get shot, you could die, you could, all sorts of things. You could go crazy. Failure scenarios are formed by the interaction between the distribution of undesirable output inputs and redundant components. So obviously there are inputs you, you, want, you desire, and these are ones that probably you plan for, and there's inputs that you don't desire. Those are the ones that end up forming the redundancies. Consider the problem of um, common causes and special causes. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard this term, uh, you can find it on Wikipedia if you type it on. But essentially, um, common causes and special causes is the, w is the way you, you c c consider what a cause is. Like, um, an input can be considered as a cause. You can think of it as an input as a cause, something that causes something to happen. And so there are causes which obviously, uh, like you can try and calculate the probability of causes. And in fact, for all the causes that you do know, you can calculate the probability for. But what about the causes that you don't know? What about the things you don't know that you don't even know? That's the black swan theory. Essentially, there are things that you don't even know that you don't know. How can you calculate the probability of things like that? So that's a bit of a question to figure out. Now, your trust is your interpretation of risk. Your trust is determined on risk acceptance, philosophy of probability, and expected degrees of success and failure. So obviously, there's no one way of succeeding. There are obviously multiple uh, forms or conceptions of, of success. Um, if a philosophy of probability is that uh, there are actually different conceptions of a probability. So when, you, when I say 20% of this will happen or there's a 20% chance of that happening, what does that actually mean? Does that mean out of 100 scenarios in multiple different universes, 20% of that will have this event happening? That's one form of interpreting probability. I know some of the st uh, statisticians here and people who study actual studies may have learned something like this. Um, and of course, the degrees of success is how you grade your success over the space and time. Okay, so uh, there's, there's one thing that obviously some people might pick it up is that what about the components themselves? Aren't they, don't they have a part in causing failure? Why is it that the inputs are the ones that cause failure and not the components? Well, the short answer is that assume the component design is perfect. The long answer is kind of a long answer, which essentially kind of uh, trying to argue that essentially your components, the component design, the, if you design your components, which is essentially that your, action, your action steps and your plan, then, you're, uh, then we're assuming that you designed them to be perfect. If you designed them not to be perfect, perfect, then that's an undesirable input, which can be considered part of an input. So the design of your plan is also an input, not just, uh, not just having the plan set in stone and having inputs coming in. So
So there's a feedback loop here. Once you consider the different, uh, your vulnerability and trust, you know that the state of efficiency and redundancy in a given system, or whatever system or whatever plan that you consider, actually affects your calculation of vulnerability and trust. Such as, um, let's say you're in a war zone, you obviously know that there's a high, there's obviously all sorts of inputs, undesirable inputs that could be happening, such as an artillery shell hitting you, a bullet coming out towards you, that's all undesirable inputs. And of course, that's, that, that state of efficiency and redundancy obviously affects your calculation of vulnerability and trust. You calculated that you, you're quite vulnerable, and maybe you don't trust that vulnerability, that risk of things happening. And that calculation of vulnerability and trust then adjusts your state of efficiency and redundancy. So when you, when you plan for anything, anything uh, such as, for example, a construction engineer plans to build a big building. Let's say the construction engineer of the two towers in America who got hit by the two by the planes. What are they called? Twin towers, right? The construction engineer was planned how this building was going to be made. There are given inputs that he planned for, such as people going in, people coming out, there's wind, there's probably, probably maybe birds on it, sometimes you know, it could rain, there could be a lightning strike. Those are all inputs that are, that are quite likely, and he's planned for it. Do you think he planned for two planes to hit Twin Towers? That's an input that he did not plan for. And so, as you can see, that kind of, because he kind of realized that that's unlikely to happen, that is a, is a calculation of vulnerability to trust. He calculated that it's, that's unlikely to happen and that I trust that, that I trust won't happen. And that adjusts my efficiency and redundancy. Obviously, I'm not going to put a redundant measure to make sure the building stays up if a plane hits it. <coughs> the balance between efficiency and redundancy needs to reflect the balance between vulnerability and trust. If there is a mismatch between these two areas, then that's when things go boom. So the idea is basically, yeah, yeah. So the idea is basically, uh, the difference between these two areas is that you're vulnerable when something, when, when an undesirable input will happen. But if, you, uh, if your vulnerability goes down, your trust goes up. Essentially, if you're less vulnerable, you should trust, your trust should be going up. If, you ha if you're m very vulnerable, then you should trust go down. But the trust is affected by, uh, by um, whether you care about it, essentially, um, and your philosophy of risk. Essentially, okay, so your vulnerability, you say, okay, vulnerability is like 20% of something happening. Okay, that's someone gave you that calculation. 20% of this thing will happen. So in a, over 100 years, 20, 20 of those years will have this thing happening. You calculated that, but then your trust is your philosophy of risk. Some people will say, oh, 20%, that's a really low risk. Other people would say 20%, that's a huge risk. Yeah. As you can see that just because you have the same vulnerability, different people will have different trust levels and since that will, that will affect that whole entire balance, and hence they, that will also affect the way they design their system. So it's like someone who's very efficient, they don't want to have insurance on them. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's like that. If they trust too much, then they don't, they're not going to need it. Hmm. Then having that insurance. Yeah, um, exactly. But it, fine yeah. for 20 years, but if they do need it, then hmm. the trust is too high, and they should have probably invested in their insurance. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. So as you can see, that the way you calculate all that kind of stuff, then then affects the way, it adjusts the way you, you modify the system to represent that thing. And so, let's go back to the, to, the, to the original relationship. As you can see, um, if your trust usage goes up, redundancy goes down, vice versa, vulnerability goes up, trust goes down. That's called a horizontal relationship. These horizontal relationships are causative. If that happens, that will happen. If that happens, that will happen. The vertical relationship is not causative. Just because your vulnerability went up and your trust went down does not necessarily mean your efficiency went up and your trust uh, redundancy went down, or your redundancy go up and your efficiency going down. That's, that, that does, that's not causative. This is the relationship that you're trying to balance. The, this is a balance, this is a balance, and these two are the ones that you're trying to match. Because by matching these two, then you cre you've created a good balance between efficiency and redundancy that reflects the vulnerability and trust that you have in this system in this plan or whatever you're doing. For example, my, if my trust is high, which means my vulnerability is low, so that's the opposite of those, angle, uh, those, tri uh, those arrows, does that make my redundancy high? No, it doesn't. The vertical relationship is not causative. They're inferred. In contrast, the horizontal relationship is causative, so yeah. So finally, it's, uh, there are some obviously some points, some assumptions that I obviously have not <coughs> touched upon. And um, the first part is trust. 
there's, there's some problems with trust because there is uh, frequentism. These are all kind of uh, interpretations of probability. There's subjectivism, predictive inference, axiomatic probability, all that kind of things. Um, I can't even explain all this to those kind of things. You probably have, can look it up yourself. And so that, uh, like, again, that affects the way you trust that things because lots of people interpret probabilities differently. Then there's issues in, uh, in vulnerability, such as, for example, this is actually um, a quote from Donald Rumsfeld. He was quoting about that when he, after he invaded Iraq and suddenly realized that there were no nuclear weapons in Iraq. Um, and he said that there are no knowns, there are things that we know, um, that we know, there are known, uh, known unknowns, that is to say there are things that we know that we don't know, and then there are unknown unknowns, and there are things we do not know that we don't know. And then of course there's issues in the efficiency and redu uh, re redundancy relationship. First is redundancy can play, take, uh, take place across time and space. So the way we drew these engines, that's kind of like taking, taking, taking sp uh, that's redundancy over space. But what about redundancy over time? Um, what about this, okay, my engine breaks, right? Then of course I've got to go to the car repair person who installs a new engine. That's kind of redundancy over time. It's kind of redundancy over space as well because obviously there's a person who can provide engines, but it's redundancy over time because you know that there's time and then you can solve it by using your time and resources to get another engine. The one must be aware that adding redundancy isn't just adding components, right? But it's adding statistically independent components that are parallel to necessary components. So just uh, if I add, uh, like I showed over here, if it was like basically, see that's redundancy because this, is, this one entire part is a necessary module for your entire plan. And if I add extra components to match that, then it's a necessary, then, then it's redundant. But if I, if, I, if I add another module and another module here, that doesn't make it more redundant. If I put engines here and engines here, that would kind of mean that this engine will only activate after this engine is activated. So that's not redundancy. That's, that actually makes your system even more vulnerable by adding more aspects to your plan. Then there's obviously, there's what's the slope constant of the relationship? So in a way, you can imagine redundancy and efficiency as two aspects on a graph. Um, and then obviously, what's the slope between that? I haven't figured that out, actually. Um, I think that that will probably depend on your calculation of vulnerability and trust, and there's lots of different ways you can think of that. Um, and then there's Pareto optimality, and then there's law of diminishing returns. The more, the more redundant you make your system, right, the less effect that has on your redundancy. Think of it this way, okay? Um, you're a city planner, and you're planning for um, the roads on your city, right? Now, you're, now, you're convinced that, um, that this one section of road, like, okay, let's all see, all the residents live in Blue Town, and all the commercial workers in Black Town, and all the Blue Town have to, all the people in Blue Town have to travel to Black Town to get to work, and they have to travel back. Right? If you have one road that's in between all the people in Blue Town and all the people in Black Town, that's caused a bit. That's a bit of a redundancy. Uh, that's that's one single road. What happens if, like, you know, that road gets destroyed or there's potholes in the road? Suddenly, you know, you get this, you know, um, traffic jams and people going off road or whatever. And then you think, okay, I'm going to solve this problem by making this road more redundant. So I added a second road, or I had a train, and I had a plane flight that goes that way and back. And I add more and more and more and more. And at some point, your city planner advisor says, you've added too much things. The more you add, the less it affects it. You know what I mean? The more redundant components you add to any specific necessary module, the less effect it has on your redundancy. And the more effect it has on your <coughs> waste, which means you're becoming, you are becoming more redundant, but you're becoming more redundant by smaller and smaller, smaller, smaller values. Whereas on the other side, you're becoming more inefficient inefficient more and more and more. So that there's, a, there's a law of diminishing returns with regards to how redundant you make your system and how, if, uh, how efficient you make it as well. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the relationship. Um, before I move on to maybe possibly a group exercise of some sort, um, any questions regarding this concept? You must have various things you want to ask. I'm not sure about it, but like you talked about like independence and the relationship between like the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
obviously redundant components have to be independent from like statistically independent. If they're statistically de dependent, that means if one thing breaks, the next thing will break, and then that breaks, the next thing will break. And obviously, that, that that's one aspect. Okay, so I, I want to show you how I con conceive of, of plans. Most people think, um, step one, oh gosh, that's, see, see, undesirable input. <laughs> Most people think of plans as like step one, right, do something, step two, do something, and then step three, do something, and step four, profit, yeah? I think what you guys can start thinking about is think of plans like nodes. There could be another node here to that node as well. The first node you have can either be a starting point that affects all the other points, or it could be a creative free will. And if you watch the first workshop, you'll see that essentially what, uh, this is a philosophical concept that not everybody would, would agree with. I know those determinists won't agree with that, but I don't think there are any determinists here on free will. Um, this uh, regardless of what this is, essentially it starts things. Now, once you get to uh, think of the think of the second level, think of se a third level, possibly um, not a component here. <laughs> you might start seeing some similarities to game theory, of some sort. Um, the idea is basically, instead of thinking your plans from step one, you can think your step one is this, right? So this is that could be step one. That could be step one. Then there could be more and more and more and more and more step one. So there's many different step ones you can have, different ways of achieving that step one. The more circles inside the step one, the more redundant you've made the system. And then, of course, there are, then you, have, you could have step two, or you could have step two here, which would actually be the big one, or you could have step four here of some sort. Anyway, the idea is basically to think of your plans as a tree diagram because you start with something, you start doing lots of different things, so you can go from different paths depending on what's happening um, around the world. Now, this is, an, this is actually fr fairly abstract as well, so it doesn't answer your question. What does answer your question is that once you start making these diagrams, you'll notice something. At some point in time, you'll realize that they stop spreading out and they come back together. Right? They come back together. This is called the Germans call it a system punct. I call it a crux, the crux node. The crux node is essentially a node, which is essentially uh, an, a, a moment in any kind of event which links between different actions. That has, that is one is, one is incredibly necessary to any kind of system. Two, it has many, many connections. And three, therefore, results in a huge amount of impact. It has a high impact node. Essentially, if this did not work, a whole bunch of things would not work. You understand? This is the progression of time. Time goes from here, starts here, and comes down to the end. So this is the this is the crux node, the system punk. They're the things that you have to watch out for. They will have to watch out for for two things. You have to watch out system punks in your enemy, and you have to watch out for system punks in yourself. Okay. So this. Sorry. Okay. So uh, obviously, in military plan, your enemy would be the enemy. Um, in the in Business planning or whatever else, your life planning, your enemy is your obstacles, things that stop you from doing what you want to do or um, achieve what you want to achieve. Like a boulder in the road. Yeah, like a boulder in the road. That's, those, are your, those are your enemy uh, systems. What, the reason you want to look for your system punk in your own plan is that if you can identify your system punk, you have essentially identified uh, your first is your primary effort. What is the one that actually, like for example, I know uh, as, as a president of ISEC, we do a lot of different things. But there's one thing that is obviously a primary effort, which is essentially our exchange. We do exchange. Without exchange, we wouldn't exist. That's our primary effort. The second thing you've identified is how vulnerable your system is. Okay. I'll give you an example like this. Um, I'm thinking of starting a business um, once, once I graduate. Now, there's actually a couple of system punks that I've uh, identified. Well, one of them is especially is getting the teacher to teach 
the thing. Well, the business essentially is a, is a t education technology. We're required to have teachers. Now the first part is obviously, I want to source an ISIC intern to be a teacher. Now, the problem with the system punk here is that that ISIC, uh, that ISIC intern who becomes a teacher, it has, needs to have very, very specific skills. Um, it's required, they're required to have a very specific web application development, a very practical knowledge that they can teach as well. So they not only have to be able to stand up in front of anybody and say everything, but they've got to know the stuff. That's, that's a very rare kind of person, and it's even rarer within the ISIC network, right? So that's a, that's a system part, because what if I didn't get that person? If I don't get that person, there is no business. Simple as that, right? That one specific link or action node, that node, links onto a whole bunch of different other aspects. And if I don't have that node, suddenly all of these things don't work, right? That's a system part of, of, of my situation. Um, and so when, you, when you're thinking about your plans, try to identify what are your bottlenecks. So that's probably a more layman kind of word that you can use, a bottleneck of your plan. That if it doesn't work, if that specific aspect doesn't work, then your entire plan is just kaput. Now, why do you want to look for system punks in your enemy? The reason, on a military level, if you look and find the system punk of your enemy, you can focus on that. Don't worry about destroying, I don't know, some marine column six million miles away. For, find your system punk, destroy that specific thing, then your entire primary effort falls apart. That's the idea. So what are the, what are the things? But it's going to be quite difficult to find the system punk of your enemy unless they're kind of like showing it. The thing is, is because once you have identified your system part, you either want A, want to make it more redundant, or B, um, make sure inputs are so predictable that it will not be destroyed or hurt in any one way. So on a military level, you can make it more redundant by obviously redesigning your plan and system so you're not so uh, reliant on that one specific point. Or you can try and hide it so that nobody finds it, and so, nobody, no, so no undesirable inputs will attack it in some way. Does that answer your question to make it more practical? Yeah. So, let's, I guess, do an exercise of some sort. 